I want to thank the Abel for making this gorgeous room available tonight. It's historic elegance is perfect for this evening's program. It is a community and organization built by and for women, and it was built 130 years ago. It's committed to enriching our lives with education, the arts, culture, and more. And they're ever so good to Writer's Block and me. The Abel is a membership organization, and they welcome you to join. They really want you to join. OK, now I've done that. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out in the rain and dealing with traffic to get here tonight. And it's going to be very much worth your while. Um, to get to the heart of a story, to get to the essence, a journalist needs to ask the right questions in a focused and precise manner. Open-ended, but not too open-ended. So journalist Michelle Norris, recipient of her profession's most prestigious prizes, such as the Peabody, the DuPont Columbia, and Emmy Awards, came up with a prompt and left it on postcards everywhere she went. Race, your thoughts, six words please send. Actually, that's seven, I think. One, two, three, yeah. Um, over 500,000 people answered her call. Her great and gorgeous book, Hidden Conversations, tells a thousand different stories. And each six-word entry makes you sit up and think. Some of the six-word submissions accompanied a longer explanation, which made for a more personal and bigger picture. The responses are from every race, gender, every identifier we can think of. They're sometimes funny or sad, or defiant. What Michelle Norris accomplished is magnificent. She's engaged hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in her quest to get to the bottom of how we in America think about race. This isn't academic or wonky. It's pretty thrilling, even as it makes us wince. Lena Waith gets to the heart of race in America with her writing and acting. You've seen her on Master of None, on The Shy, which she created, on Dear White People, on Westworld, and on, um, oh, yeah. She won an Emmy for an episode she wrote for Master of None, in which she also appeared and racked up another screenplay win from the Black Film Critics Association for Queen and Slim. She's been nominated for a Tony for Writers Guild and NAACP Image Awards, and so many others. So here's what's going to happen tonight. Lena and Michelle will chat. When they're through, we are going to give them the postcards that you've been busy and eagerly filling out. Uh, and then there can be some questions from you. Afterwards, Michelle will sign copies of Hidden Conversations in the lobby. I urge you to get yourself a copy. It's riveting, and it makes a great gift for anyone who's interested in this thorniest of issues. Thank you so much, Michelle Norris and Lena Wave. We'll use the mic, you know, they're all small. Yeah, thanks for coming out in the rain. We appreciate it. And especially to, to hear this conversation, which isn't like always the feel-good subject of the year. Um, first of all, Michelle, thank you so much for letting me talk to you about this book. I'm, I'm very excited. thrilled. I just try to find excuses to hang out with Lena. Look. So. <laughs> well, obviously I accepted the call because I like hanging out with you. Um, I've been living with this book for a while, and I think that's sort of the experience is like you pick it up, you read a chapter or two, and you kind of have to sit with it <laughs> because oftentimes I'm reading about someone's experience that I probably wouldn't have the opportunity to meet or have an opportunity to be in dialogue with them about that, about race or identity. Um, and, and also I love your writing, obviously throughout your, your composing all these stories, but you also help you're walking us through it in your beautiful way and making sure we're, you know, you're our tour guide, if you will. But the first thing that sort of popped out at me after sitting with the book and reading it is why is it so difficult for us to talk about race in this country? It's like 
race and sex. Mm -hmm. They're like these uncomfortable topics. Uh, the second one we're not here to discuss tonight, but, but there's some the of that first in the book one, too, just there's, so you there's, know. There's, it comes up, you know, it's a part of it. But that was the thing that really kept coming to me as I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you. And that's the first thing. Why, why are these conversations hidden? Why are they so, why are we so ashamed to talk about it? I think, first of all, thank you so much for, for being here. This is a big week. This is awards week in LA. <laughs> Lena has had a big week, so she's going to be, you know, so the fact that you took time out of your schedule to talk to me this week, and I just want to reiterate my thanks to all of you because this is one of those nights where you could make a cup of tea and just get all cozy okay. at home. Stay home. So thank you for coming out here instead. Yes. But I think one of the reasons that we don't talk about race is because we're told that we don't talk about race. And I think that that is not true. Okay. And I think that's sort of true about sex also. Right. Like, actually, we're talking about these things all the time. Right. I mean, listen to the news, read the paper. It's always happening, right? It's in our politics. Right. It's in our entertainment. It's always there. But we tell ourselves that we don't want to talk about it because we're allegedly uncomfortable about it. And because of the discomfort, there are people who are, control the narrative, mm -hmm. who try to suppress the conversation. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they try to suppress the conversation is because it makes perhaps them uncomfortable. Yeah. And because we are a nation that has experienced over more than, you know, over hundreds of years, institutional amnesia. And this is not a term that I came up with. This is something we just heard this weekend from Professor Michelle Elam, she talks about at Stanford, talks about the institutional amnesia. We are the land of the free and the home of amnesia. We engage in a willful forgetting yeah. of the things that are very difficult in our origin story. Yeah. We have a really difficult origin story. Yeah. And because we can't figure out how to tell that story, we try to wall off this thing that is all around us. And so we're allegedly not talking about it, but we're talking about it all the time. Which leads me to my second question, which is what are the consequences of us not having healthy conversations about race in our country? Because, um, which also kind of leads to another like question I have for you, which is conversations are happening and they're happening online, mm -hmm. they're happening on social media by you know young people um, trying to in a way undo the the non-work that the people the generation that came before them sort of didn't do so there's a lot of conversations happening but we're also the algorithm can fit our needs and and so I'm just curious how much harm happens when we don't have the conversation in a real honest way, but then also how much harm happens when you have a bunch of people having the conversation, but there's no real desire to understand each other, and it's more about let's just be in discourse, yeah. because that feels like I'm doing something, and I'm engaging in the conversation, but there's not any real conversation about how do we achieve progress, how do we move forward. So on one hand, I think we're also dealing with two extremes. Mm -hmm people that don't want to talk about it, don't want to discuss it, and want to move forward. And also there's a generation of kids that are like, this is all I want to talk about, this is my identity, but they, there isn't a desire to hear people who have different perspectives. And they're doing it on social media, which is not the most productive place to exactly. do that, where people can feel like, want to say that, but it can feel like a it. rain of fists, and people just will say almost anything. Exactly. Just saying. Yeah, discuss. Just, just keeping it real, uh -huh. and then, you know, and it's easy to do that, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't say that to their face. Exactly. You wouldn't say it necessarily in a room like this. Right. Um, there are consequences mm -hmm. to not talking about this, and some of them are, um, are sort of big and grand, and some of them are granular. Mm -hmm. So the big grand conversation is that we don't know our history, right. is that we don't understand we don't understand our origin story, mm -hmm. that we don't understand the benefits of our diversity mm -hmm. because we're afraid to talk about the good and the bad. So we don't talk about the good either. You know, right. we don't talk about this. And it, in that vacuum, it allows people who are invested in a divided America mm -hmm. 
to exploit people's fears, and there are a lot of people who are deeply invested in a divided America, and they are, mm -hmm. they are, they are playing a very long game, yeah. and they're spending money, and they're doing focus groups, and they, they are literally invested in our divisions. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not talking about who we are as a country and the things that we have in common, and yes, even the things that divide us, it's harder for us to um, narrow that chasm. But the other sort of granular consequences are spelled out on the pages of the book. Right. There, there is a chapter in the book, um, when you read the book, and notice that I said, when, when you read the book. Yes. yes. <laughs> Not if you read the book, we'll but when you read the, the book. We'll reference the chapters, and if they don't make sense, it's okay. They'll, they'll make sense later. <laughs> there is a chapter in the book called Breadcrumbs. Right. Which I was going to get to. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. But it is a chapter about three, it's three stories. It's an essay. And the essay basically spells out why I was surprised that so many of the stories that appeared were about grandparents. Right. The word grandmother, grandparents came up over and over and over again, and I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, people would maybe tell their, there were lots of things I didn't expect, but I thought people would tell their own stories. But then when it, you know, you think about it, it makes sense that the difference between a 20 year old and a 80 year old and the America that they lived in is really different. So people are talking about that, but they're also talking about what they discovered sometimes about grandma, like there's a woman in here who, just, who discovered her parents met at a KKK rally, mm -hmm. found the robes in a trunk, right. you know, and discovered that that's, that, was their, that was their origin story. Exactly. Um, but in the breadcrumbs chapter, there are three stories about mothers who all lied to their children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the birth certificate. Because of the secrets. And, and I had to write, there was a hard chapter to write, and it was hard to write it in a way that you wouldn't judge them. Right. Because they did things that you really, one woman gave up several children. Mm -hmm. um, they were mixed race. Right. And the story of how that unfolded right. was, you know, the kind of thing that you would make a film about, uh, frankly. True. I mean, but there's also the one, isn't the birth certificate story in there too, the one about where the mother... Well, that's, there's, that's there's different... one involved a birth certificate, mm -hmm. one involved a phone call, and, um, and I'll give you the beginnings of the story, mm -hmm. but uh, a woman named Diana, she is white. She lives in California. Um, she's a wonderful woman I've gotten to know. I've, the nice thing about doing these stories over time is I talk to several yep. people longitudinally, so I get a chance to talk to them over time. And she gets a phone call. And she gets a phone call from someone who claims he's her brother. I think we're related. And she thinks he's a solicitor of some kind, that he wants something from her. He doesn't believe. But then he knows something about her mom that most people don't know. Her mom has a name, Winifred. Nobody knows her as Winifred, but he knew her as Winifred, and so she's like, well, maybe he, huh. But she rushes him off the phone because she thinks he wants something from her. And she goes to work, but she can't concentrate. So she calls her mom, and if you listen to the audio book, you hear her tell the story herself, because the nice thing about the audio, since I worked in audio, I wanted the audio book to be an experience, so buy the book and get the audio book. Yes. Because um, in the book you get the pictures, but in the audio book you hear the voices. So I interviewed yeah. several people, and so you hear them tell the story. And uh, she's, she's at, I almost wish I could hit play so you could hear it, but she calls her, Mom, and she has this great accent that, that I can't quite get right, but Mom, and she's the only child. She said, did, did you have a baby before I was born? Long pause. And her mother says, I, I did, I did. I was working as a telephone operator. I just couldn't take care of him. He was black. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about listening to the audio tape is when Diane tells a story, she starts laughing. She's like, ah, well, that was something I wasn't expecting. You know, and she's kind of, which is the way you would respond, right? She kind of makes light of it, but then she's, she says, okay, all right, mom, you know, thank you for telling me. And she can't concentrate at work, so she, she leaves. And she goes, and the person who called her was Ed. And she calls Ed, and she didn't know Ed was black. 
because she couldn't, you know, he, and I've talked to Ed many times, and you, you would talk to him, and you wouldn't know that, you know, if you just listened to him. And she calls Ed, and she's actually kind of excited because she's been an only child all her life. And she says, I have a sibling now. This is kind of cool. I have a brother. This is actually kind of cool, and he's older than me. I have a big brother. And so she tells Ed that she's excited about this, and Ed says, well, did she tell you about the rest of us? Right. The book is, yeah. You, can, you should see your face right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and Ed has three siblings. Right. And she, um, the mother gave them up to foster care. Now, before you judge her, because you probably will want to judge her, this was 1960s San Francisco, and even with San right. Francisco with its long-haired progressiveness, right. um, she had four brown babies. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get work, couldn't get an apartment. Uh, and her family was like, don't you bring those babies back here. You know, her mother said, don't, don't you bring them home. So she gave them up for... Um, to foster care with the proviso that they all four stay together. That's as much of the story as I'm going to tell you. You have to read the book to hear the rest. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, there's, in in breadcrumbs though, it's about sort of artifacts as well that are sort of left behind, either by accident, maybe on purpose, which you kind of speak to. And it sort of got me thinking, because there's one particular story about someone who feels like, is it a shelf, is it? I know you described it as a shelf made by slaves. Yeah. That was, was, that's what it was, was it a it was shelf? A, it was a sideboard. A sideboard. Yeah. And, and the person didn't want it in their home because it was haunting. It felt like a piece of history that they didn't want to have to acknowledge. And, and looking at that again, before we sat down to speak, I thought to myself, what are we to do with these artifacts in a way? Is there, because I do think there's something to preserving them and, and having them and knowing that this is a living, this is a, a piece of our history yeah. that we shouldn't discard. So I was just curious in your mind, because obviously there are also, I know a lot of vintage collectors and people that, you know, it, it is, it's almost things that need to be in a museum or it can be in your home to honor the past. What do you think is supposed to be done with these, with these artifacts, really, from history? I, I think we should listen to the stories that they're trying to tell us. Right. And that particular story is also in the breadcrumbs chapter. Yeah. About someone who is inheriting a sideboard. Do you know what a sideboard is? Right. I was you know, trying it's to a, envision it. It's a fancy buffet, but it's it's more ornate than just a buffet, mm-hmm. and it has a and this this one was it weighed almost two thousand pounds. It had a big heavy marble top on it, mm-hmm. and it was um, when he he would he dreaded the day that he would inherit it because it would it would mean two things happened. Um, it would mean that his parents passed away because they had inherited it from their parents, and that he would come in his home, and it would also mean that that history would come into his home because the sideboard was created by people who were enslaved. And he'd have to look at that and it would remind him of his family's history. And he, um, when I reached out to him to find out you know, more, because I wanted to know more about the sideboard, and he, he told me, oh, it was destroyed. You know the story. Yes, I do, but yeah. Um, and I was so mad. Yeah. I mean, I was emotional. Like, I, I, I took a walk. I was crying. I was like, wait, you, you destroyed this ornate, beautiful thing. And it turned out, I then called him again, because, again, I've done this work longitudinally. I was able to talk to him. Turned out he didn't actually destroy it. Destroy it. He, he sold it. Right. And, but he wanted it destroyed. And it's a metaphor for our history because as we were talking, we taught each other things and he taught me what he learned about the people who created, you know, look around a place like this, Mm -hmm. you know, these ornate ornate furniture and moldings and things like this. The people who did this work were craftsmen, but oftentimes they were unacknowledged. Their artistry was unacknowledged. And he said, he taught me that many of the people who made 
furniture from live oak, the you know, really heavy wood, um, that the enslaved did that because it was dangerous work. So a single blade could cut 50 pine trees because it's soft wood, but live oak is hard. So the blades fly off the wood, and as a result, there were several injuries. People would lose digits in their hands, they lose arms. Um, so the enslaved created that. And what I did is, I was so upset about the sideboard, I started looking at um, the history of the enslaved people who made, who made furniture, who did ironwork. And they often used their artistry to create a language because they were not allowed to learn how to read or write. So they would use the artistry in the filigree of ironwork, in the filigree of the carvings, in the dental molding, um, to send messages to people, sometimes who were in the big house, sometimes who were in other places, and their work sent messages about births and deaths, marriages and survival. They created a language through their, their wood carvings, and and I thought, how could he destroy that? But it turns out that it, he sold it. It's in a warehouse in Kansas somewhere. And he has befriended the person who he sold it to, who is an antique dealer. And, uh, and when he talks to him every so often, he finds himself asking, how's she doing? Mm. Mm. How's she doing? Yeah. So he's realized something that I think we as Americans need to realize, that we should perhaps start trying to bury our history and outrun it, and instead listen to the stories that these artifacts are trying to tell us. And, and I have a somewhat complicated view of even monuments. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that we should memorialize, you know, people who were trying to divide the country in the name of holding people bondage. But I also think that we should listen to the history that the creation of those monuments are trying to tell us. Mm. Because that's a, you know, that, that the North won the war, but lost the narrative. Correct, correct. Yeah, I mean, which takes me to memory wars, you know, in which you tell a story in which um, a white woman, I believe, was at the National History, uh, well, what is it, National African American Museum History and Culture. Um, we just call it the Blacksonian in Washington. The black, yes. <laughs> I wanted to be, you know, like specific. But um, she basically said, why does the, the museum begin at slavery? Like, can we skip this? Can we, do we, I mean, it's an astonishing story. I love the way you write it and you talk about it because to me, it, really, it was, a, it was a, a metaphor for how we behave as a country not wanting to look at that. And so it sort of made me wonder, you know, obviously when you talk about Germany and we all, a lot of people have sort of been educated about how Germany has had to come to terms with their past and how, my question is, will we as America ever get to that place where we can actually sit in our history with hopes that we won't repeat it? I think we, can, mm -hmm. and I think we actually will eventually. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. I mean, we're not, you know, this is doable. We're not talking about splitting atoms. All right. You know, this is something that can be done. Mm -hmm. It just is going to take will, and it's gonna take discomfort, mm -hmm. and it's gonna take people who are willing to make the case for doing this. I mean, the interesting thing, Germany, you know, there's a whole chapter on, mm -hmm. and I don't speak German, so I'm going to butcher this word. Mm -hmm. It's but, a long one. Uh, it's, it's, I think, 28 Yeah, I just looked at it. I didn't even try to Verwagenheit auf Eidbekung. There you go. Better than me. I didn't, I know I butchered They don't know. It. But okay. it basically is the German word for working through the past. Correct. Mm -hmm. not, not trying to work, get over it, get under it, just working through the past. Right. And Germany was mandated in some way to do this, to get in the good graces of the Europe of the European economy. They wanted to re-enter, they wanted to be, participate in the European economy. Mm -hmm. So this was one way, atonement was a way to do that. Um, there were other reasons also, it came sure. from the ground because people, you know, their kids were suddenly asking, well, what were you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, where, where were you at in all this? And people were very uncomfortable and so it didn't really come from the government, it came from grass, that's the thing that I thought was so fascinating right. about it. 
it came from the grassroots, from people in always, you know, Berlin, Frankfurt, but all these you know small towns and hamlets right. saying we have to do something about this. Right. And when people would travel, you know, the Germany had a bit of odor to it, you know, when they moved about the country. Um, they were trying to sell goods and services. They were trying, no one wanted to buy a love bug, a Volkswagen right. Beetle, mm -hmm. you know, from a country that had. So there, there were all kinds of incentives for them to do this. But Richard von Weizsäcker, who again, I don't speak German, so I'm not saying his name right, I'm certain, um, was also one of the people, his dad was an SS captain. And, you know, who stood before the Bundestag and said, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, as a country, we, we will never be well as a country. We will never be free as a republic. We will never be able to move forward. We need someone like that here. Right, right. I and mean, but is, is that why we are still afraid to talk about race? Is that, do you think that's a symptom of that? Is because we haven't really dealt with it, that we aren't equipped to even have a conversation. And also too, I love, at the end of the book you talk about it's impossible to think that all of us in America will agree mm -hmm. on the way to move forward. But we have to build a bridge and then you make it very clear that building a bridge is very difficult. Yeah. It's really hard and it takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of cooperation. And I love it, you say you're pragmatic, you're not pessimistic, yeah. you know, and because as Baldwin said, as long as you're alive, you can't be a pessimist. Um, and so mm -hmm. the thing is, is I read that, and that's a little bit toward the end, I'm kind of jumping to the end here, and there's an idea of yes, we can use our common sense and know that it won't be easy, but it's possible, but there, for some reason, because I think our society also celebrates individualism or individual yeah. Yeah. journeys and my own, taking care of my own, my own yard. Mm -hmm. But my question to you is, what are, not that you have to solve the problem, but it does make me want to ask you, what are actionable steps that we can take in our everyday lives to walk toward that bridge yeah. together? So before I get to that question, I know the it's actionable a big things, the reasons that we don't talk about, there's not one reason, there are yeah. lots of reasons. And we should just acknowledge that this is difficult. I mean, if you, were, if you were part of a cohort that, you, if the, your family history was, was tied to people who enforced segregation, mm -hmm. who enjoyed segregation, or who were silent about it. Right. Let's just acknowledge that that's, that's, a, that's a hard conversation to have. That is a hard history to embrace. So sometimes I just think that just saying it's, you know, acknowledging that mm -hmm. is, is worthwhile. My, my faith tells me, uh, my faith tells me that I hopefully will not be judged by the worst of my actions. Mm. Come on. I'm not perfect. Right. I have done things that I myself will probably have to atone for one day. Come on. And I hope that I will not be judged by the worst of my actions. But I know that unless I look back at the worst of my actions and take the lessons, I will never be my best self. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true for a country also. Right. That we will never be the country that we can be unless we are willing to look over our shoulder and take the lessons. There is no reconciliation without truth. The countries that have done this have, truth and reconciliation are like cheese and macaroni. They go, you know, peas and carrots. They go hand in hand. Um, so how do we, what are the practical steps? You know, I'm not a panacea. I feel like, in, if anything, I'm like the MRI machine. Right. You just like not, you show you, here's where the problems are. Yeah, I, I help you see the wound and the extent of the wound. But I do think in some small way, that looking over the fence at someone else's life, you know, and, and for other work that I've done and for the, the first book I, I did, I spent a lot of time researching segregated Birmingham because that's where my father is from. I was raised in Minnesota, my father's from Birmingham. And it was so interesting to read the letters that people were writing, the minutes when they were talking about creating laws and policies that kept people together. Fear was driving that also, but fear of small things, fear of proximity, fear of proximity. They were so afraid 
They were so afraid of kids playing sports together. They were crazy about dances. Mm -hmm. You know, and remember the how Negro music. Oh, yeah. We can't have the kids listen to Negro music. Right. Their kids were listening to Negro music. It was really good music, right? They were dancing. Yeah. But what they, what they didn't want is for people to come together. In Los Angeles, I worked at the Los Angeles Times years ago and found letters that they didn't want Latino kids and white kids to always play together or to oh. work together. Again, because of proximity. And you know what they were afraid of? They were afraid that people would see humanity in another person. Right. It's as Michelle Obama says, it's hard to hate up close. Yes. And when you're close enough to see someone and see their humanity, it's, it's hard to do that. I did a, a story about the US Marshals. Um, when I was at NPR, and I, I, as a journalist, I'm always interested in the stories that are on the outside, and I'll get to what, the, why this is important in a minute, mm -hmm. on the outside of the frame. Not people like in the center, but in the outside of the frame. I see my friend Todd Purdom, and you understand the importance of that. Not just who's right in the middle, but the story sometimes is the people <coughs> at the edge of the frame, right? And so, I wanted to do a story about the Marshalls, because we knew Ruby Bridges' story, right? Right. But we didn't know if you've seen the problem we all live with, that, that wonderful Norman Rockwell painting, oh, yeah. and all you see are the Marshall's shoulders and their big brown shoes. And so I tracked down some of the Marshall's, and most of them were gone. Wow. You know, there was just a handful yeah. of them who were able to tell their story. And they were so proud of the work that they did. Yeah. In fact, one of the Marshall's, who, who was actually at one point an avowed white supremacist. Wow. When he died, he had his ashes spread at McDonough 19 in Louisiana because he was so proud of that work. But the story that I want to share with you is that they often chose Southern marshals to do the work mm. because they were sending them to Southern schools and they figured they could deal with local law enforcement. It would be a little bit easier for them to understand the lay of the land. And one of the marshals I talked to, we didn't put this part on the radio, but I still have it in my notes, he said that he went to pick up one of the little girls, not Ruby Bridges, but one of the, there were three other little girls that were at McDonough 19 along with her. And, um, and, he went, and he went to pick her up and she had not finished her breakfast yet. So he was standing in the living room and he could look through the living room and he could see a china cabinet. And he said in the china cabinet, he saw something that made him, gave him a jolt. He saw the same china that his wife had in her china cabinet. Wow. And that messed him up. He thought, oh, there are two things. Yep. First, they have nice things. <laughs> they weren't supposed to have nice things. They have nice things. And then he said the second thought was, I wonder if he's as pissed off as I am that his wife is spending <laughs> their money on plates that we will never use. The commonality. And, but that was the commonality. He, and he said that, was, that flipped the switch for him. Because before, he, they, were, they were other people. They were alien to him. And that small thing of seeing that China made him think, they're, we're living the same life. Yeah. I was told that they're, they're something other than human, but right. they're just like me. And I wish we had more just like me moments. And that gets to this you know, my small contribution to this is in a moment where so much of what we consume in our media diet right. affirms or confirms what we already believe. Right. We have these devices that allow us to communicate much, much easier. We are, we are, you know, it's, we can, we know much more allegedly because of all the information that comes to us on right. our phones, which you have all thankfully silenced this evening. But it doesn't mean that we are better informed. It often means that we are walled off from each other. And so this book, I liken it to walking around. My, like when I was a kid, I grew up in working class neighborhoods, um, Minnesota. And then in the summers, I'd go to Birmingham. And it, because we were in working class neighborhoods, no one had air conditioning. And so in the summer, people would throw open the windows. You probably experienced this too oh, where yeah. you grew up. No, yeah. People didn't have air conditioning, so you, people had the windows open in the summer. When you moved around in, um, in Minnesota, we had alleys. And when yeah. you drove up and down the alleys on our bikes, I, I had a, a, my, my, my Stingray bike mm. with a banana seat and the, the handlebars. That mm. like that. And we would ride up and down the alley 
And in the summer, you could hear everybody's business mm -hmm. because the windows were open, so you knew who was, who was arguing all the time. Right, you knew right. who liked baseball. <laughs> you knew who was, who was trying out for the choir because they were singing their arias. And that's what this book is like. Oh, yeah. It's like roaming through America's neighborhoods when the windows are wide open and you can hear something, you can peer over someone's fence. And not with the goal of agreeing with them or singing Kumbaya together, because I just think that's asking too much. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, um, in reading the book and like just hearing all these different stories, all these different voices from all these different walks of life, because it's not just people who are visibly othered, it's also, you hear so many stories from white folks who are like, I'm a hillbilly, so people assume I'm racist, or I'm a Native American, people assume I have an alcohol problem. It's, there's all these things that... I people, have red hair. Yes, it's just, I mean, there's... I think my temperament is, you know, it, of a certain kind. Right, and, and so, but to me, I think, hearing all those voices, my biggest takeaway was that it feels like people are a little frustrated with feeling as if they have to pay for the sins of their father because there's this element of, and this also pops up in some of the stories from some of the white folks like saying, well, I wasn't there. I didn't do that. That was my great grandfather or uh, an ancestor I've never met. And I think that was something that really rung out is that we are sort of paying a debt that we don't really get to benefit from. <laughs> but you're also receiving a dividend. Absolutely. That you, you know, if you, if you, want, you're not responsible for that. Correct. But there are dividends that have accrued to people of a certain race, mm -hmm. the majority culture, because yes. of yes. laws, policies, customs, right. you know, of a previous America. You know, majority of the stories that, um, that we've been doing this work 14 years, and, mm -hmm. and it was kind of crazy that it started with postcards, but, you know, and then now we collect most of the stories digitally. But in the 14 right. years that we've done this, the majority of the stories in the majority of the 14 years have come from white Americans. Wow. That's and that shocked me. Because when I began this work, I did not know that I was going to embark on a 14-year odyssey of listening to white Americans <laughs> talk about race. I didn't even think that that was possible. <laughs> That's funny. But because the numbers are so large, we have a full spectrum. I mean, there are, there are people who will roll up to, most of the stories now come to the website, and they'll roll up to the website, you know, the fellow from Florida. Mm -hmm. um, white privilege, earned it, enjoy it. Bet you won't publish that. Mm. And then we put it on the website, because there's a website where we publish of these stories. Of course you do. Yeah. And, uh, and they're like, oh, wait, I get a seat at the table too? And then some people wonder, why does he get a seat at the table? Well, we're trying to hold a mirror up to society so you understand the lived experience of race. And he's out there. Right. You know, so his story, you know, should be, should be included as well. Yeah. No. And, and a question I want to ask you is, how much does race impact our identity? Because I think, and I know everyone is different, mm -hmm. although in, in listening to all these stories, it's quite clear that it has a, a huge impact on, some, on many people's lives. But there are some people that it's such a huge part of who they are. Um, and then obviously there are some people and some of these stories exist in the book where they say, this, this is just a part of, of who I am. It's not, it doesn't define who I am. But I was just curious in terms of how many stories you've read over the years. Is it, It's just so fascinating to me that it really does determine a lot about how we see ourselves based on how people see us, based on stereotypes, based on our racial identity. How we see others, how we see ourselves. Um, some people who just don't want to see it at all, they exactly. just wish that they could be colorblind. Correct. Racial fatigue is a real thing, mm -hmm. and many of us have it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just tired. Can it just be over? Yeah. I'm just tired about all of this. Uh, but I've learned some key lessons that I, if I were doing this again, it's called the race card project. I'm not sure I would call it the race card project next mm. time around. Mm, interesting. And that's why the subtitle of the book is What Americans Really Think About Race and, and Identity. Exactly. Because a lot of the stories that come in are not tied to race as we traditionally think about it. Skin color, hair texture, the box you check, 
Um, we have a lot of stories, as I mentioned, about red hair. We have people story who write in about being in the military, people who write about um, coming from Appalachia, and when they right. go home, they are as country as a sugar sandwich. Exactly. And when they're not at home, and when they show up at work, and because they are a professor, they button it up. They, you know, we call it code switching. Exactly. You know, but they have a different. A but you also don't think it. of a white person like having to do that, or just unless, unless you're reading the book, or even like someone who's like, "Oh, I'm from the South, and I'm a white person," yeah. and so there's assumptions made about that. In a or way, pe or people who adopt children, and suddenly they're thinking about race because they have, um, okay. because so they've adopted a child, and they go to the grocery store, and people right. are like looking at them and doing the. Are you the nanny? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing how many stories actually happen at the grocery store also. Oh yeah. I was, I, when I put Hot the book bit. together and I, I was looking at the manuscript and I just said, Is it? and I put grocery store and all these stories came up and I realized, yeah, it, over and over again, yeah. you know, people followed at the grocery store. Right. Um, people who say things to someone, is that your son? Right. Um, there's a story in there from a woman from Massachusetts, her six words were, I think it was, This man has your daughter. I can't get this. I can't remember exactly what the six words are. Someone has your daughter. Is basically. Oh yeah. And she was at the. She normally goes to this store, corner store, with her little girl, who's brown. She's white. Someone from the store calls her. This man has your daughter. Because mm -hmm. uh, he had her phone number somehow, and he called her, and she said, "Is he tall? Broad shouldered?" <laughs> Brown skin? Yep. That's my husband. Yeah, that's her father, yeah. But the interesting thing is when I called her to talk to her on the phone, she said the person who called her was a person of color. Mm. So how many of you in your mind thought that the person who dropped a dime was a white person? How many thought it was a white person? And See, again, assumptions. Mm -hmm. Assumptions. You would be surprised at what people could pack into six words. Because I've always wanted to do a table read with Lena, would you read some of them from the back with me? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Because you and may be thinking. we have some of yours out there, so we'll read yours as well. Like, what, what could I mean, you, you possibly say in six words? Well, why don't we go, there's, in the back of the book, when I wrote the book, I, I actually studied a little bit about, um, I wanted the book to have momentum. So the book, it, 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 when you look at this big, thick book, you may be thinking, oh my God, that book is so big. <laughs> it weighs 3.8 pounds, but it's. It's not it's, that daunting. <laughs> it I has promise. 287 photos. There yes, are amazing lots photos. of um, graphics, and so it's not, it, it's kind of laid out like a cookbook. Yeah. You know, a lot of colors, and I wanted yeah. it to have a, I wanted it to be a jewel box of a book, and I studied classical, I studied is maybe too big a word. No, it's okay. I, I looked at how classical music and how um, jazz were composed, because in both jazz and classical, they have movements. Yeah. Like, you, you know, you have different chapters within the music, yeah. and I wanted the book to have that sense that some places you were moving quickly, some places we had to give people a break. Yep. And at the end of the book, there is something that's much like a tone poem. It starts on page 445, I mm. think, 446. And it's just a lot of six-word stories with no backstories just coming at you. And right. it's sort of like Handel's Messiah, mm -hmm. you know, or, or at the end of a Miles Davis composition where Weird. everyone is just improvising and it's just kind of loud and there's all this... So this is what it, you know, I imagine walking through JFK mm -hmm. or LAX and you're just hearing all these voices if you could actually see the thought bubbles. Exactly. So. Um, Do you want to start? Let's, let's, let's go easy. Let's go, let's start okay. on page 448. Okay. Because it kind of warms up a little bit by then. It's starting to cook. True. You start. Okay. Do I just pick anyone that I think is interesting? 448. Yeah. Am I going from the top? Yep. Okay. Easy to assume. I am guilty. Terrified, you assume I'm judging you. Hardest jails to escape are gateless. Pride or crutch, please decide now. Sometimes I'm angry at white people. Am I failing my Latino son? I am not like my parents. Talking about racism creates more racism. I really like a black guy. That's funny for me to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love black guys. <laughs> I'm a girl, not a fantasy. To you, always the exotic other. I am more than just white. Didn't sound Chinese on the phone. Really, but you don't look Mexican. I thought you would be taller. 
Thank God it's a white woman. Every now and then, I remember. Grandparents passed. New tree, no roots. White. Whatever I do is wrong. Angry black men are so scary. Embarrassed that I'm frightened of black boys. Minority obsession and majority guilt trip. Stop seeing my son as a predator. I was taught fear of others. Everyone's racist in their own way. Always putting other people at ease. You don't have to whisper black. <laughs> and people really do do that, don't yeah. they? <laughs> He's black. Uh-oh. There's nothing wrong with my hair. Got tired of straightening my hair. That's a good one for me to read. <laughs> my natural hair is not a statement. Let's do one more page. Okay. Yeah. But you're not black, black. I'm light skin. My black is harder. I always get that I love, one. I love that one. That, it's I fitting. always get it's that fitting. one. It's, it's like... fitting. It's fitting. <laughs> Red hair gets the most stares. Black kid in my math class? People can hear the unspoken words. Just stop making everything about race. Repeating proper pronunciation hurts my feelings. Can't pronounce my name? Try harder. Born in America, I am American. You don't know what I believe. Wouldn't have been white 100 years ago. So much depends on so little. Son upset, called white boy on bus. Why must our differences be wrong? This old wound will never heal. Mm. Oh, no, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, damn, that's made me forget my, my next question. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Well, I mean, I mean, I think that to me is uh, what's so fascinating about the book because and they're littered, by the way, throughout. But, you know, this is a bunch in one place, but as you flip through the book, there'll, there'll be pages in relating to the story that you just read that kind of fit into that. Um, my question is, there's my question. It came out to look at it. Do you think the conversations we're having online mm -hmm. about race and identity are helpful or hurtful? Both. I, I would agree with that. Both. Can you tell I me mean, they're helpful. on that? Because sometimes, you know, I, the metaphor of peering over the fence, mm -hmm. sometimes you can do that online. You can look into worlds yeah. that you, you wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. um, but you, there are no follow-up. Right. It's, it's often for the benefit Just of being provocative. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you can get doxxed, yeah. you know, from, from people who swarm and, and try to intimidate mm -hmm. um, or shut down you know, a conversation. So it, it, it can be productive and it often is not productive mm -hmm. and it certainly is incomplete. Right. I mean, that's one of the lessons, big lessons for me as a journalist and it was very humbling. I've been practicing the craft of journalism for more than three decades mm -hmm. and I've put together a body of work that I am very proud of. Mm -hmm. And it, um, but I realize it's not that it's inaccurate, it's that it's incomplete. Because this has been, this crazy little project which started with postcards mm -hmm. is a taproot that has allowed me to hear stories and go places that I could not go otherwise. And it makes me, it made me realize how often I just wasn't getting beneath the surface. Right. And what happens, usually as, as a storyteller, as a journalist, mm -hmm. I'm showing up because something has happened that merits my attention from National Public Radio or from the Washington Post or when I worked here at the LA Times. Something happened that we in the newsroom decided we have to cover it. Right. We are agenda setting in that sense. Right. But in this book, this is what happens when individual people set the agenda and they talk about what's important. And so a lot of the things that are in headlines, you know, Barack Obama's name will be in here a couple times, sure. Donald Trump's name is in here a couple yeah, of times. Course. Yeah. You, we hear about the border, we hear about Muslim bans, but most of the time what people are writing about, even when they're reacting to those things, is their commute, mm. their work, their lunchroom, mm -hmm. their son, their marriage. There, there is an intimacy to these stories that allowed me to see an America that otherwise wasn't available to me. And so now I come to the conclusion you talked about productive conversations. Right. I think the most productive conversations are the ones that we never hear mm. because they're not happening 
in a television studio, and they're not happening online. in Studio 2A at NPR. They're not happening online. They're happening on the edge of a soccer field. They're happening in a beauty shop. They're happening, we have been, I should say the Race Car Project is used in hundreds of schools. And we have partners, we have corporate partners, we have institutional partners, but every so often someone will call us and say, we can't figure out how to talk to each other. Will you just come in and allow us to use the six word stories so we can create a cultural bridge? We can create a trust dividend that maybe we can cash in later. And we have, as a result, been in some of the reddest counties in some of the reddest states. And in some cases called in by factories. So the foreman of the factory regardless of his politics, which probably aren't the same as mine in the places that I'm talking about, is dealing with a workforce that is deeply divided. The divisions in the world play out in classrooms. They play out in school boards. They play out in factories. So when we go to this factory, you know, and because of NDAs, I can't tell you what yeah, company yeah. is, but um, you walk through the parking lot, and the parking lot tells the story of the divisions that you're going to see inside. So you see bumper stickers that say, Make America Great Again. Mm -hmm. And you see bumper stickers that say, Black Lives Matter. And you see bumper stickers that have rainbow flags on them. Mm -hmm. And you realize when you get inside the factory, that is all playing out in the factory. So right. the foreman, the person that runs the factory, and then the foreman brings us in because those divisions are affecting productivity. Right, that was really fascinating. It, it's making it hard for them to make their deliverables. Right. They can't it's, work together. They can't work together. They don't trust each other. Right. They're seeing higher rates of, um, of injury, higher rates of people calling in sick, which, which to them suggests that people aren't calling in sick, they're calling in well. It's like, I feel too good to go to work today wow. and deal with that mess up there. So, you know, the, these divisions that we're talking about, and this goes to, you know, why we should do this, right. we need to create new incentives for doing this. Correct new incentives for doing it because that affects our GDP. Mm -hmm. If you talk to anybody in the military, they're seeing this in the military. It affects our military readiness. It affects, you know, whether the EMTs, if you, if you have to call for someone to come to your house because you're sick, you better hope that the three people in that ambulance are all getting along with each other and are communicating, together. right? You better hope that when you are caring for a loved one that's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And if you've been to a hospital, hospitals are not homogenous spaces. No, hospitals have some of, if you look up doctor, yeah. if you look, put the word doctor in Google, the results still look like Marcus Welby. Yeah. You know, and that's not who you're gonna encounter in most hospitals. So you hope right. that the people who come from very different backgrounds are communicating with each other so that they can save your life. And so there are practical reasons that we need to figure out how to build these cultural bridges so that we can actually have productive conversations so we can actually be productive in life. I love that. I mean, and before I get to my second to last question, I want to sort of, sort of piggyback off of what you were saying, because it's also about the narrative. It's about how do we convince people something is good for them. Mm -hmm. And it's a weird thing, because that's why the left kind of gets criticized a lot. It's like, guys, like, you have a media problem. You know, how do you convince the world that we are better together, that it's not just about the greater good for me, but the greater good for all of us. And hearing that in terms of the, the lack of productivity, people not getting along at work, that is a narrative that you can kind of sell. But like you said, we, it is more lucrative for us to be divided. It's more lucrative for some people. For some people. I, I, would, I, would, I would bet money I don't have on this that the people who are invested in a division in a divided America are doing that because it, it benefits them. It keeps them in power. In some cases, it just keep, hold, makes them comfortable. I'm better than them. So, you know, True. that... And, but there's also this level of, you know, being with your own is more comfortable. Yes, but, and, that, but, know, that's, but that's also, also... That's human nature. True. That's, that's you know, and, that, and we have to acknowledge that. And that looking out for self is also human nature yes. in some ways yes. as well. Yes. Looking out for your own family, looking out for what you And need. bias is also part of human nature. I mean, we just, that's why, you and know. Also this, media, whoever controls the media controls the mind yeah. as well. And so it's about. But, but controlling the, the narrative is something that maybe we have to figure out how to do in very small ways. So you said, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that we are better together is 
my personal view is that America needs to tell itself a different story. Mm -hmm. To and, accept that out a little bit? And to figure out how to do that. Um, instead of saying America is better together, we have to figure out how to be better together. Right. You know, just reframing it just a little bit. Right. So it doesn't lead to the fatigue and the frustration because we're supposed to be better together, but we're not. Right. And this is icky and ugly and uncomfortable. Right, and how do we fix it? It's, it's more it's like, like how do we... to go to marriage counseling. You know, I mean... Which isn't fun, but it's necessary. Or either that or sit in a pretty loveless marriage, which it seems like America's doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and, and listen, I am honest about sometimes you have to protect yourself, and protecting yourself means distancing yourself. It doesn't mean if, yeah. it, if someone means you harm. Yeah. If someone is challenging who you are individually and is moving to a place where that means that you are not safe, you know, you don't necessarily have to engage with, with everybody. That's, right. that's not necessary. But America does need to figure out how to tell itself a, a different story. Right. And you talk about the new generation, um, about we sort of think that, oh, automatically y'all will figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. y'all will kind of, because also there's this theory of everybody will be mixed and da 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 da, da. sort of this sort of fairy tale land we tell ourselves that this race thing won't be an issue. But I do like the fact that you kind of take that to task, sort of saying, well, no, there's some work that needs to be done. But I was curious if you felt like the younger generation is, will do a better job of doing the actual work and having the harder conversations than even my generation, the generation before me, because I do feel like, and I'm talking youth, youth, like, like the kids, like the question we seem to always ask ourselves in the privacy of our own homes is, will the kids be all right? And it depends on the day, what we're seeing. But I was curious to ask you if you felt like this next generation will be able to kind of look at each other and say, we can sit at these separate tables in a lunchroom. Like I remember that whole experiment, you know, the, the black kids sit with the black kids, the white kids sit with the white kids. We're sort of, we're, we're repeating behavior. It's, it's like this is almost self-enforced Jim Crow. Our, and that's my own generation. The kids coming after me, do you feel like they have a better sense or a better handle on this conversation that has been hidden for so long? I, I do, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm from Minnesota, it's in the water and we have a lot of water up there. <laughs> And, um, and so I tend to be an optimist. And I think that the kids will do better, but I think we do them a disservice if we just say, go fix this for us. Because we kind of do that. Like, oh, they're going to fix it. They're going to solve. They're going to cure cancer. They're going to solve racism. They're going to figure change, out climate they'll change. They'll figure it out. Yeah. We ain't got time. Yeah, and that's crazy because we're expecting them to do something we weren't able to do. And instead, I wish that we would gird them for what comes. Right. And give them the tools, you know, to understand um, that it will be, the hill will be steep and craggy sometimes, but it's worth trying to keep climbing. Overall, though, I, I you know, I hope so. I, I have children. I became a grandparent recently. I um, hope for the world, you know, that, that Carter is part of a generation that does have it easier, but I don't think that it will be easy, mm -hmm. you know, for them. And I think I we just have to acknowledge acknowledge that. I actually have a lot of hope in your industry because okay, I think words are, <laughs> well, words are, are how we find each other and narrative oh, is important. And yeah. I, you know, at a time when we're removing books from schools, when we are changing the way that we educate children, it doesn't mean, you know, there's this you know, Skip Gates always quotes this old African proverb, and I never know I if, it's, if it's actually an African proverb or if it's just something that Skip made up. But I listened to everything he said. Yes, it's <laughs> profound nonetheless. And he says that body that you tried to bury in the backyard has a toe sticking out of the ground today. Oh. You know, and the idea that you can't bury things, that right. they, they, they come up. Right. And, and so we can take the books off the shelves, but it doesn't mean that the narrative won't, they, they won't find it through music, through film, through streaming, through poetry, through music, through all the other expressions of art. And so I, I actually think that art is very important right now. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I think it's very, very important right now. Um, you know, hard times call for furious artistry. 
<laughs> and and so I really put a lot of faith in in what you're doing, and I so appreciate what you do with the platforms you have to ask us, you know, to look at some of these things. The um, even through comedy, mm -hmm. you know, to ask us to think about um, how we struggle with our identities, how we as families, you know, to take us inside places like that. And so, I, again, I think those 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 the potential for this will come from the grassroots, will come from places that are outside of big marble columned buildings. It's on us. Yes, no, you're right. It, it, it makes me think about, you know, my job or my responsibility as an artist and as a black person, as a woman, as a queer person, and, but also having to stand in a space of no judgment, yeah. which I also think is a space in which you stand in as well. Because in a way, what I do is also a form of journalism. Yeah. Because Absolutely. I have to be objective. Like I, I, I can't, you know, write. You know, if I, it's irresponsible to to paint characters with broad strokes. Yeah. So I have to use a tiny, you know, paintbrush. And in doing that, I become a better person, a more well-rounded person, and hoping that the audience will also sort of. That's that's our job, really humanizing groups of people, but it also gets kind of complicated because if I as a black artist want to explore black pain or black trauma, black history, there may be segments of my community that may say, I don't want to see that. And that's okay. Yeah, or say, or should you be able to profit off of that? Or do we have a right to criticize that? Or, and, and so there's this thing of having amnesia in our country mm -hmm. about the history and then also us not wanting to see it reflect in film and TV and so sometimes it can be erased not just by those that don't want to be blamed but by those that don't want to have to relive their ancestors past. So I'm going to sound like an old black woman now and say everything's not for everybody. Right. You know and that's kind of the answer to that right mm -hmm. is you're not going to please everybody it's impossible. but you have to remain true to your gifts. True. Very true. And I love that about you because you remain true to your gifts. You know, I don't have a choice. It's like, look, Nina Simone said it. It's an artist's duty to be a reflection of the times. Um, and I think that's because it has to be a, a time capsule. Mm -hmm. Some of these movies, some of these TV shows. So if people do try to ban a book, you can at least hopefully find a movie or a TV show. Uh, to wrap up our conversation before we start to read what you guys wrote and to hear from you, you know, it was very interesting at the end of the book, you talk about America and who it belongs to, mm -hmm. and you pulling up on a gas station, <laughs> and a guy who's a white dude, you know, being very patriotic, maybe, if we will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you kind of, in a sort of your instinct, it says, yeah, yeah, <laughs> go America. What do you say? <laughs> you're like, you're trying to like, <laughs> trying to, you know, not, do you do the opposite of what maybe his yeah. expectations were. Yeah, it totally surprised him. I'm sure. I'm sure. And I, you wouldn't know this, but I have a tattoo that says, I too am America, yeah. which is the quote from Langston Hughes, which yes. I really resonated with. So in, in reading that and looking at that is a very interesting thing. And also I got it a long time ago. So my um, relationship to that tattoo changes and morphs over time. But it's a reminder that this land belongs to us too. And, and it belongs to everyone. It's like, if you're an American, in a way you're almost saying, let's take race out of it for a second. And that's the thing that almost unites us, is that is that's what we have in common, a flag that is both, it's a complex one yeah. that we pledge allegiance to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, I thought it was a really beautiful way for you to tell that story at the end of the book and that, you're just as American as he is, and you have as much right to this country as he does. What was it like for you reflecting on that story, and what were you really trying to communicate with people reading the book? I, I wrote that story really with my kids in mind. Mm. You know, um, I, the, the story she, that Lena's talking about, I was at a gas station, and there was a dude who pulled up, and he was, you know, rocking like Bachman Turner Overdrive, or, you know, like old, you know, classic rock. It was actually it was more like heavy metal, but. Mm -hmm. And he had a gigantic flag, like, I mean, gigantic, off the back of his truck. And I walked past him, and I was, um, I don't know why I did it, but I looked at him, and I was like, go America. Thank you. 
that is not something that I would ever say. I don't I know. even know. Like, you know when you walk by and you see something, and it's like, what did I, what, why did I just do that? <laughs> but it was like, yeah, my flag too. And I, I was compelled to do that because I, my parents, um, my father's gone to glory. Uh, my mother's still alive. And if you went to visit her in Minneapolis, you might catch her in one of her pages. She wears sw sweaters that have flags on them. You know, okay. she's, you know, her cardigan sweater has flags all over it. My dad um, served in a segregated Navy, um, was wounded uh, in his leg after a scuffle with a police officer in 1946 when he returned from his military service when he was trying to enter a building where he would learn about the Constitution so he could pass a poll test. And a police officer tried to, my dad was very zen. I mean, he's not the kind of person, it, it was, and I never knew about this. I learned about this, that was my first book. I learned about this from an uncle, and it, he never told me, never told my mom, never told my sisters, but everybody in Alabama knew about it. That's why everybody went north. My dad and all five of his brothers went, went north to Chicago, and then eventually Minnesota. Um, and despite living in Birmingham, despite serving in a segregated military where he wore, you know, if you were in the Navy at that point, you were a man of color, most likely you wore a C or an S on your uniform. You were a cook or a steward. And, uh, and he loved a country that did not love him back. And he was very patriotic in like a weird way. I mean, he was super, in, in, in the 1970s when I had my be afro my big afro, and it just, you know, a more militant time. I didn't understand it. You know, he had this beautiful rose garden. We lived on a corner and people would come and look at his roses and he would plant flags um, in the ground, you know, so people would see that. I, it, it was like, I too am American. Yeah. You know, it was like Langston Hughes. So I am so grateful to have been raised by uh, parents who taught me to love a country that might disappoint me sometimes. And I wanted to pass that on to my children. And I wanted to also let people know that all the kind of aggressive flag waving is often, um, is often uh, gatekeeping, to say it's ours and not yours. And I quote Joan Didion in the book, and she's talking about California, and she says, a place belongs to the people who claim it most fiercely. She was talking about California, but I think that's true of the country. So the flag is ours. Fly it proudly. Yeah, beautifully said. Beautifully said. Um, now, here's my question. Are we going to read some of these, or are we going to ask if you guys have questions first? Questions. Yeah. We're gonna... Okay, do we have a mic? Yeah, so we can hear you. I know, we have a lot. Okay, we're going to take gonna, a few questions, and I need people to stand. Just a few questions, because... We want Michelle to read a few of the postcards. Yeah, and then she's going to sign some books for you. Yeah, and too. then she's going to sign books. So we want to give you guys time And you want to that. read this book. Okay, do you I have do. a... Uh, okay, there's Thank a you. question. Thank you both for being here. I have two questions. Um, Michelle, when are you going to have Lena on our Mama's Kitchen? Because <laughs> that show needs to happen, and I need to listen to it. <laughs> And then my she second. Just asked. <laughs> but my mom didn't cook that much. Let me talk about fast food. But I'm game. <laughs> That's part of the stories. And I was curious if you see any correlation, and maybe you could explain Mama's Kitchen if anyone doesn't know, between the two projects, and if you'd share your thoughts on that. So I, I host a podcast called Your Mama's Kitchen. And um, every episode of the podcast begins with a simple question Tell me about your mama's kitchen. And it was based on when I hosted a uh, show show at National Public Radio called All Things Considered, we often had to do... A little tiny one. <laughs> uh, we would do mic checks with people to get their... their um, so they could talk a little bit to make sure that the levels matched. And generally when you ask people to do a mic check, you ask a question, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? It's not enough. I needed to hear you talk more. So I would ask, what did you do for fun on a Saturday night when you were a kid? What was your first summer job? Or tell me about your mom. I had a list of questions. But the tell me about your mama's kitchen always got people comfortable and they revealed things. So the correlation 
This was going to be the project I did where I didn't talk about race because a lot of the stories on this are, this are heavy. So this is my escape, you know. That, but most of the conversations actually hinge on identity because that's where we form our identities. That's where we learn about grace and justice and grit and generosity, you know, is at the kitchen table, watching our parents, watching how they learn to be American, watching how they stretch a dollar. Um, so they're very much related. And when I was just in San Antonio, someone blew my mind because the, 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 the question that I asked is six words. Tell me about your mama's kitchen. I didn't even put that together. Wow. So, yeah, there is a correlation. And yes, Lena should come on the show. I, okay, it's going to happen. <laughs> my publicist is here, so she's like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Hello. Thank you so much for being here, both of you. I can't wait to dig into the book, Nichelle. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that you were shocked um, that the book uh, primarily was resulted in stories of white America. And I wanted to know what other emotions that stirred in you and why you think that was the response, particularly um, less of a response from African-American people. Did you, what, what are your thoughts about that? It wasn't that there was less of a response from African-American people. It was just, you know, most of our conversations about race are by, for, and about people of color. I mean, you know, they're, if, if we're going to have a conversation about race at your job, doesn't, you know, people turn, and what do you think, Michelle? Right. You know, I mean, it's... Colored person. <laughs> yes. You know, and now you're up. Um, and so that's what I, uh, that's who I thought would, would come. But we had a large number of people who were white, but a lot of people who were Latino, who were part of the broad Asian diaspora, who were indigenous, who were often left out of conversations about race. And that's again where I talk about race and identity. When I started talking about race and identity, we started to get more cards. More cards, for, for instance, from people who were Latino. Because often the entry point is about ethnicity. It's not necessarily about race. You know, so I learned that I had to be more elastic in my, in my language. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I was um, surprised by that. What was the second part of your question? Okay, yeah. yeah that, that's a good question. Okay, before we get to uh, reading some of what you put in on the postcards, we have one more question. No? Yeah, one more front. Oh, we do? Yeah. Oh, so. I can't help myself. It's a journalistic endeavor in my head. But I guess part of what I see when I'm out in the country mm -hmm. is that people want history to start when it's convenient for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that's affected what you see when you were putting this book together. And, you know, I shouted out a family member early on. You, 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 yes, I know. I know. Thank you for being here. Um, so... The question is, people want to deal with history when it's convenient. That works sometimes, but in order for us to do this the right way, we kind of have to deal with it sometimes when it's inconvenient. And that kind of goes to finding better incentives, you know, for having the conversation and figuring out how to, I mean, we're both journalists, right? And figuring out how to have these conversations outside of the month of February, for instance. Right. You know, I mean, I, am I right about that? I mean, people would roll up to me in February and want to do a six-part series on something that they would not want to do in October. Yeah. They'll do it in June, too. You've got June, too. Now. Okay, yes, because Juneteenth. Juneteenth, we have another entry, another yeah. portal. Um, but, you know, I'm always fascinated by this because if you look at the bestsellers list, there are often six to ten books on the big list, you know, the list of 20, and on the list of 10, there's usually three or four that are about history. It's not that we don't like history. You know, Americans love history. We're just like, we just have kind of an a la carte attitude, you know, about it. Like, we want this history, but not that history. I mean, I, I have read many books about Abraham Lincoln, for instance. I, you know, Elizabeth Keckley is barely in any of those books. Um, so it's, it's figuring out how to tell a fuller picture. And part of that is making sure that the people who are telling the stories, who are making the films, who are making the operetta, you know, who are doing this, that, that it's a, a broader pool of people who have access, you know, to tell our stories. 
Thank you. Before we read from this, can I just ask a question of the audience, because I've learned to do this. Is there anybody in the room who submitted a story that's in the book? That'd be cool if we had somebody. It's okay. I, I ask this because in many of the places that I've been, people will stand up and say, I'm page 274, wow, or I'm page 315. And so I now know to ask that. That's crazy. Um, are we ready to read? Yeah. Let's do it. OK, so should we split them up again? Sure. Okay. You take some. We'll go back and forth. Do you want to start? I'll start this okay. time. Our cuts run deep and hurt. That's Elizabeth. I'm not white, I'm black Irish. <laughs> okay, who, this is a beautiful card. It's got a drawing on it. And it began with there's space in the choir for us all. And she crossed that out. <laughs> um, you and you know, it, it, you, I, know. You, I, I, I like the cards because when people send the stories in digitally, they cut and paste and I don't see the thought process. So in this case, you sort of see the thought process. But then it lands with harmonies Choirs are best with all types. And there is an email address, but not a name. You should claim, you did, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful artwork on that. The Lottery of Birth. Without lament, we will not change. And here, two more. Thank you. One big exclusive party. Your hair is your saving grace. Uh, I think this is longer than six, but I appreciate the. But you don't sound black. <laughs> and then there's a second one. I bet you're blonde with blue eyes. Books aren't defined by their cover. Segregated schools allowed for a historical arrogance. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, good. that's I think seven words, but we'll let you pass. <laughs> Playgrounds, a bubble, primo, division. I'm going to give you a few more cards because I think I have more than you. It defines who we are always. Heartbreaking, illuminating, frustrating, and ever evolving. It's still troubling not being seen. I know the person who sent this in. Uh oh. That's good though. It's my last one. Uh, perfection, yet surprised when I thrive. Mm. That's good. Thank you. Make up constant free, made up construct, free my mind. Karen. A mostly intractable barrier to connection. Our blackness can birth new possibilities. Wish I understood more about it. No, no, not that box. The word colorblind ignores and erases. I will never fit in anywhere. Mm. Exclamation point. Wow. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all for, for your being candor. So vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you both. This was so this was truly terrific and I'm so proud.